too long ago, my wife was looking for a specific kind of tea to help her with the nausea that so often accompanies pregnancy. So she found one. It was a tea that contained ginger. It was a tea that marketed itself as one that supported healthy digestion. But when she went to purchase it from a particular website, she could see that there was also a warning. And you could click on the warning and you could read the warning. And the warning said that this tea contained acrylamide. And as the quote went on to read, it said that acrylamide is, quote, known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. Now, regardless of what you think or don't think about acrylamide, you might appreciate the fact that that is there, right? That people through this website, you can click on the warning and you can say, ah, oh, now I know. I, I can make an informed decision. I know that there are those who say that this is unhealthy and I can then make an informed choice whether or not I want to purchase and ingest this particular tea because it might be dangerous to my health. And if only it were that way with false teaching. Imagine if before a false teacher came on the TV set, if all of a sudden there, were the word, there was the word warning in red print right on the screen with a black background, followed by something akin to like a pharmaceutical warning, like you know the warnings you hear on pharmaceutical commercials? Something that said something like this, what you are about to hear is a mixture of truth and error, which has been known to produce dangerous side effects like decreased appetite for sound doctrine, Increased propensities for covetousness and contentiousness. Depressed spiritual immune systems. And in some cases, even leading individuals to desire to be false teachers themselves. Don't you think that would be helpful? I think there would be some people who would say, Ah, no big deal. My body can handle that spiritually speaking. And they would just continue to ingest spiritual toxins. But I think that there would be many who would be deterred from perhaps their regular ingesting of spiritual toxins if there were warnings like that, that preceded and prefaced what comes on the screen. I mean, there's a lot of dangers that you would do well to be warned about when it comes to false doctrine. I mean, it results in not only the things that I had just mentioned to you, but it could result in misconstrued conceptions of God, His will, and His promises, yet alone increased appetite for more and more false teaching. And I would have to imagine that some people would be deterred if there was a warning like that that preceded the false teacher showing up on the TV screen. But just as false teachings are not limited to TV screens, computer screens, and phones, they could come in a whole bunch of ways. They're not limited to that. We need to be on the alert for them wherever they might come. Just as some people would like to, you know, mitigate their involvement with toxins that you might find in the environment, or toxins that come via food, or toxins that come via emotional stress, or toxins that come via EMF. And a person might say, I want to do well to mitigate my interaction with some temporal toxins. It's all the more wiser to mitigate your involvement and to make sure you have just about no involvement with false teaching that can arise not only from phones, computer screens, and televisions, but also the false teachings that can arise from family traditions, that arise from this world system, that arise from entertainment, that arise from the education system, that arise from your own flesh, and that can arise from pulpits and pews all across the world. As the text will bear out, if you're going to have a healthy spiritual life, you have to eat right, spiritually. And you have to avoid unhealthy interactions with false teachers and false teaching. Now as we make our way into the text, so as to create some context, you might remember going back to the opening verses of this epistle, the preeminent reason why Timothy was left in Ephesus. Paul told them, I'm leaving you here, Timothy, in Ephesus to command certain men not to teach strange doctrines. You see that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I mean, most recently, we have seen Paul instruct Timothy so as to instruct the church in relationship to how the church should handle widows, how the church should handle elders, how slaves should be obedient to their earthly masters in that first century context for the priority of the gospel and the reputation of God. But now, as we get closer to the end of this epistle, Paul revisits 
the idea of false teachers and false teaching. And we see that just about immediately as we get into our text. We begin in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, which reads, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, and we're ending there. So he, he, Paul's going to continue that thought in verse 4, but we're going to stop there for the moment. Let's walk through the language that Paul used here. First, you'll notice, notice, as noted by many commentators, the word if, as it appears in our English text, begins a conditional clause that, interestingly, assumes the reality of what, precede, of what precedes it. In other words, although you see the word if here, it's framed in such a way that what's coming up is not hypothetical. It's actual. It's not a potentiality. It's a reality of what was happening already in the church of Ephesus. Second, Paul uses the word anyone. And that makes a significant amount of sense, which you would expect from text that is inspired by the omniscient spirit of God. He says anyone here, and in this particular case, Whereas sometimes he names names, here he doesn't name names. He doesn't say, for instance, if Bill, Rick, and Denny teach otherwise, leaves it general. And there'll be times in Paul's epistles where he'll call out people individually. He'll call out, you know, a Hymenaeus or an Alexander. But here it was an appropriate, it was appropriate that he would speak generally. Because if he named some in this particular context and failed to name others, the others might appear as though they were off the hook. And so this would be one of those times where Paul's going to give a general description and it's up to the church, most immediately in this case Timothy, to see if the shoe fits a particular false teacher. Here's the description, and you Timothy, you church, you see if the shoe fits. Now who is Paul singling out generally? You look at the text. Anyone that teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Now again, in more ways than one, this verse brings us back to the opening verses of Paul's epistle to Timothy. It's interesting because when he says the word here, teach otherwise, it's one word in the Greek. It's heterodidaskale, conjugated form of heterodidaskaleo. Basically just meaning if there are people who are teaching otherwise, if there are otherwise teachers, well, what's an otherwise teacher? An otherwise teacher, to kind of get at the language that Paul is using here, is somebody who is teaching something contrary to sound doctrine or something that's not promoted by sound doctrine. It could be the unbiblical or it could be the extra biblical. It could be something that goes right against the words of the Lord Jesus Christ or it could be a fanciful extra biblical myth or endless genealogy that somebody wants to lead people down a wild pa a path down so that they might travel on this road towards a higher extra-biblical spiritual knowledge. And it's interesting because in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul told Timothy, I'm leaving you in Ephesus so that you might command certain men not to teach otherwise. Same word. I want you to command certain men to stop teaching otherwise. And here we are, and he's using that same word again. As we've already seen, again, going back to the first chapter, there were people who were teaching endless myths and endless genealogies or myths and endless genealogies as though it was the gospel. And all the while they were burying the gospel. They got bored with the biblical and they became fascinated with the fanciful. We saw also back in chapter 1 that there were some who sought to use the law of God unlawfully which most likely meant that they were either saying, hey, the law of God is a means to get right with God. Instead of getting right with God by grace alone, through faith alone, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, these ones who thought they were handling the law rightly, but they didn't understand what they were doing, they use language that Paul uses in 1 Timothy chapter 1, they're using the law unlawfully. So likely saying, if you want to get right with God, keep the law. You want to stay right with God, keep the law. That's a strange doctrine. That's an otherwise teaching. 
Strange doctrine essentially would be anything that contradicted sound doctrine. Let me give you four instances. Most immediately, we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2, Paul told Timothy to teach and exhort what he had just written to him. Right? About slaves in that first century context having a greater priority than their freedom, namely the reputation of God and the gospel. So, an otherwise teacher would teach other things, for instance, either leaving aside what Paul wrote or plainly contradicting it. Some might teach servants to be insubordinate instead of submissive as an exercise of autonomy instead of respecting their earthly masters for the purpose and priority of God's glory. I mean, it could be anything. Anything that contradicts sound doctrine. If anyone taught others to dismiss the authority structures that God put in the local church, in government, in marriage, in parenting, in the workplace, or so on. If anyone taught that you shouldn't pursue marriage, like remember what we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 4? Don't pursue marriage and don't eat certain foods. If anybody was espousing things like that, they were an otherwise teacher. If anybody said, you know, the law is the means to get right with God instead of faith in the person and work of Christ, they were an otherwise teacher, teaching, if you will, strange doctrines, doctrines that are either unbiblical or extra-biblical. These are not the kind of teachers you want to listen to. <laughs> you want your teachers to be orthodox, not heterodox, yet alone unorthodox. But it's not only about the wrong teaching that they dole out. More about that shortly. But it's about what they deny and as a result of what their hearers are denied. They don't consent, as we're told in the text, to wholesome words of biblical truth. And as a result, their hearers are then dangerously deprived of those wholesome words. Interesting language that's used here. The, the language that's used for wholesome words essentially means healing or healthful words. Look at that picture. Biblical truth is life-giving and it's soul-nourishing. You see that much essentially in 1 Peter chapter 1 and in 1 Peter chapter 2. It's life-giving and it's soul-nourishing. It begets new life and then it nourishes the new life that it begets. These words, the words of God found in the text of Scripture are, if you will, your healing springs. They are antibiotics, as it were, to cure you of the infection of selfishness at least for a time, until it arises again and you got to take your next dosage of the Word of God into your heart. They are anti-inflammatories, these words, that help suppress the inflammation of anger and worry. They are, if you will, antioxidants that protect you against the free radicals of worldliness. Now, people often go wrong when they pursue to heal themselves or themselves without consulting these healing words found in the text of Scripture. When you seek to do that, and you seek to try to heal yourself apart from God's Word, you set yourself up for, as it were, unnecessary wilderness wanderings. And perhaps today is the day where you hear to use language from Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 3. You have circled this mountain long enough. Now turn north. And north for you would be analogous to obedience. To say, you know what? I've been traveling this, this mountain, as it were, trying to do things my own way, trying to heal myself my own way, and I've been neglecting these wholesome, healing, health-filled words of God. And instead of circling this mountain, maybe it's time for me to turn north, and north in this case would be analogous to obedience. Obedience. Even if you don't like the way that these words immediately taste. You know, it could happen, even though these words are sweeter than the honeycomb, that the virus of disobedience and obstinance might have affected your taste buds. And these words don't appear to you as tasty as they truly are. See, this passage, just to make an application, this passage within the context deals with anyone, anyone, right? Paul said, if anyone. So it's not just false teachers that can be found in pulpits, it's false teachers that can be found anywhere, pews, pulpits. So this is dealing with anyone that can affect people, if you will, from without. But I do want to warn you about the false teaching that can arise from within as well. Because there's a lot of false teaching that can, deny, can arise from within. You could deny wholesome words while also denying the false teaching of false teachers. 
You can stay away from the junk food of error while also staying away from the medicine of scriptural teaching. Let me just give you a for instance. If you say in your heart, thinking of whatever particular struggle it is, I cannot obey Jesus in this way. Well, that's a false teaching. That's a rising up from within. You have denied the wholesome words of Scripture that tell you in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that God has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him so that you might escape the corruption that is in the world. Those are wholesome words. It's an antibiotic for that wrong way of thinking. If you were to say, well, you know what? I'm going to figure this out myself. Nobody understands anyway. I'll figure this out. I've got the answers. You deny the wholesome words in the Scriptures that repeatedly tell you to seek wisdom from God, from His Word, and in the book of Proverbs, multiple times from others. If you say, I'll never be over this sin. I have battled this sin for so long. You deny the wholesome words of Romans 6.14, which says, no sin shall have dominion over you. So you don't only want to be aware of the false teaching that can arise from without. You want to be aware of the false teaching that can arise from within. Because you could say, I reject that false teacher, but you embrace your own false teaching. And you've got to be aware of both. Yes, if you embrace a particular false teacher or fa false teaching, it's like, it's like hiring a fast food cook to be your personal chef using fast food. But you also want to be aware of what you cook up for yourself. <laughs> because if you keep eating those lies for too long, it will make the healthy words of truth appear less and less tasteful. Back to the text. Paul elaborates upon what these wholesome words are in the latter part of the verse when he writes, Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Now the expression, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, means no less than the words that Jesus spoke, particularly those that are found in the Scriptures. But the broader implication is that it refers to all Spirit-inspired apostolic teaching that is from Jesus. After all, to reject apostolic doctrine was and is to reject Jesus' words. You can look at Luke chapter 10, verse 16, for instance, when you look at those people, those disciples that Jesus sent out, and those who heard them heard Him. So you can see the broader implication of the language that's used here. Just as, for instance, Jeremiah spoke the word of the Lord to his contemporaries, Jesus' apostolic emissaries were speaking Jesus' words to their contemporaries, and by extension, us. Furthermore, note that wholesome words are identical with the doctrine which accords to godliness. Okay, so he's, he's saying if anyone denies wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which accords to godliness. Well, what does he mean here? Well, remember earlier, the Apostle Paul had written, kind of what appears to be him taking part of what was a first century hymn in 1 Timothy 3.16. He spoke about the mystery of godliness. And he said he appeared in the body, speaking of Jesus, with vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up to glory. All that to say the mystery of godliness is rooted to the incarnation all the way to the ascension. Godliness has its root in the person and work of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done. But to apply this even further, the doctrine which accords with godliness not only affirms that true godliness is inextricably connected to Jesus Christ and what He has done, it affirms that a necessary consequence of believing the gospel is a life that pursues godliness. All who are in union with Christ will pursue godliness. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2.19 that all who name the name of Christ are to, are to depart from iniquity. Paul, writing to the church of Rome, he described Christians as those who have been set free from slavery to sin. 
and have become slaves of righteousness, Romans 6.18, and slaves of God. So false teachers, to kind of summarize verse 3 so far, false teachers will teach otherwise. They'll teach other things. Things anti-biblical, things extra-biblical. But they will also repudiate what they should be affirming. Rather than giving consent and agreement to the wholesome words of Christ and the doctrine that accords to godliness, they exercise their dissent by not mentioning wholesome words that they should be mentioning. That's one way it could happen, right? You could be dissenting to the Word of God, not by coming out and saying, I disagree with this. You could just basically say, I'm just not really going to talk about this. It's kind of a shrewder way to dissent with the Word of God. Dissent with the Word of God. Well, that's one of the ways that they do it. They exercise their dissent by teaching unwholesome things, as though they were the wholesome words of Christ. They exercise their dissent by twisting wholesome words that should be left untwisted. In some cases, wholeheartedly disagreeing with the wholesome words that they should be submitting to and treasuring. And or just leaving out biblically prescribed expectations of godliness. Now Paul continues by describing these heterodox teachers. In verse 4 he wrote, He is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions. And again, although the thought continues and he's going to name something else, namely constant friction in verse 5, we'll stop there for the moment. So first notice, beginning of verse 4, Paul calls attention to the attitude of a false teacher. And basically saying an outworking of verse 3. Right? In verse 3, what does he say? If anyone does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine that accords with godliness, he is conceited. That makes sense, right? You've got to be pretty prideful to disagree with Jesus and think you're right. And so that's what he's saying. He's saying if anyone does that, they are conceited. They might not look conceited or act conceited. They might you know, posture some false humility, but at the end of the day, they are conceited. They think they know better than God. Interesting language that's used here. The Greek word translated conceited is the word tufao. It's a word that we have seen earlier in 1 Timothy. And it essentially means here that a person is beclouded. That word that's used here is connected to smoke and has the image of smoke billowing. And it speaks of a person being puffed up and essentially blinded as a result. We saw this early in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, Verse 6, Paul said that a novice should not enter into the office of an elder lest he become conceited. Tufao. But it's not just something that's limited to those who aspire to the office of elder or false teachers. It's something that Paul uses, Paul, as a description that Paul uses to describe people in the last days. In 2 Timothy, Paul gives a list. 2 Timothy chapter 3 of what men and women would be like in the last days. Remember that long description? Saying that men and women would be lovers of themselves. They would be lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers. They would be without self-control, slanderers, unforgiving, unthankful, disobedient to parents, treacherous, reckless, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Well, he also includes in there the word conceited, tufao. It's not just something that you see in false teachers. It's not just something for those who aspire to the eldership and get put to the eldership too soon when they're not ready. It's something we all have to be on the lookout for. Everyone. But in this context, it's speaking about those who teach otherwise. Pride, after all, is associated with false teachers. Luke, in Acts chapter 8, verse 9, he speaks of Simon. Simon the sorcerer, right? Simon the magician. As somebody who astounded the people of Samaria with all the, the works that he did. And then Luke includes an interesting description of this man in the second half of Acts chapter 8, verse 9. Simon was someone who claimed to be someone great. Simon did not have a problem with self-esteem. He thought he was someone great. And a lot of his followers bought into it too. You'll find that with a lot of false teachers. Their followers think they're someone great. 
And in the case of Simon, the people were like, this man is the power of God. But again, getting back to the context most immediately, Simon was somebody who thought he was someone great, and anybody who rejects the counsel of Jesus Christ, the words of Christ, wholesome words of Scripture and sound doctrine, they are conceited. They think they're greater than they ought to think. Paul spoke about the false teachers who were troubling the Colossian Christians as those, quote, inflated without cause by their fleshly minds. Colossians 2, 18. So as a general call for all in this moment, rather than walking in the footsteps of false teachers who march according to the beat of Satan's drum, remember after all, Satan was the one who said in his heart in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will make myself like the Most High. We would do well to walk in the footsteps of somebody like Moses, known to be the most humble man on the face of the earth. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. And who, in a very real way in that sense, prefigured the ultimate example of humility. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. As an aside, other problems with pride include the fact that pride keeps people from receiving both correction and direction. Right? Because a person who's proud is going to think, I don't need to be corrected. I, I, have, I have things figured out on my own. I am above correction because I've got it figured out. But they're also above direction because they're just going to do what they want to do. They don't think anybody has anything to add to them. They're like, whatever I want to know, I could find out myself. And that is unwise. Not wise. Again, as alluded to earlier, there are so many texts of Scripture that call us to seek wisdom from God's Word, from others, from God Himself. Well, continuing, Paul communicated a great irony. Although such a one was conceited, anyone who teaches otherwise, Paul said, he understands nothing. Got to appreciate the strong language that Paul uses here. He's conceited, but he understands nothing. This again recalls language from earlier on in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul spoke about those teachers of the law who did not understand the things that they said or affirmed. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. You could look at it this way. False teachers are going to have words of divine truth, but if you will, they cannot speak the language. If you will, false teachers will play some notes, but they can't play the proper medley, melody. It's like whatever they know, they don't know as they ought to know. And their teaching is put in the context that it ought not to be. And Paul's saying, if anyone rejects the words of Christ and the doctrine that accords with godliness, he's puffed up, he's conceited. And the great irony is, is that they are actually conceited over what they don't know, thinking that they know. But this is what a false teacher does have, Paul writes, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words. Now, there's nothing wrong with questions. Questions are good. Questions can invoke great learning. But there is a problem with, to use language from the text, a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words. Now, again, Paul's using language here that is kind of health language, medicinal language, if you will. That word that's translated here, morbid interest, is a conjugated form of the Greek word noseo. Noseo, and it essentially means to be sick. He's basically saying they're puffed up, they don't understand anything, they don't know what they ought to know rightly, but this is what they do have. They have, to kind of get at the, the literal sense here, they have a sick interest. It's kind of an unworking, it's like an outworking of their spiritual fever, if you will. They have this sick, unhealthy addiction in controversial questions or disputes about words. So their minds weren't filled with the gospel and the truth that's inseparable to it. Their minds were filled with 
controversial questions that they wanted to pursue. The Greek word that's used here for controversial questions essentially means foolish speculations and fruitless investigations. Let me give you a little bit of advice. It's a good rule of thumb. Concerning good questions and bad questions and how do you distinguish between the two, good questions involve trying to better understand God's revelation. That's where you want to go swimming. Those waters are deep enough. You could swim in those waters for the rest of your life and you won't plumb the depths of those waters. Bad questions involve going outside of those buoys, as it were. Swimming in waters you have no business swimming in. When you get outside of the biblical text and you start pursuing these controversial questions and you're diving into waters that are dangerous for you to swim in. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us that the secret things belong to the Lord. You have more than enough to pursue in the Word of God. Go swimming and deep sea diving in the revelation of God. Because when you go deep sea diving in things that aren't revealed, you may not know it, you may not even feel it, but it will affect you in so many ways negatively, spiritually speaking. The secret things belong to the Lord. But these ones that Paul is speaking about here, they also enjoy disputes about words. Logamachias. Essentially word fights. Not friendly word fights like Scrabble or something like that. These are like unfriendly verbal quibbles. If you wanted a kind of caricature, you can kind of imagine two men beating up one another with lexicons. And just kind of saying like, Let's, oh, no, 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 this word should be used like this. No, this word should be used like that. And they just get into fights. And a lot of times, false teaching arises from things like that. People get their hands on a lexicon and they're like, oh man, look how this word's used. I think it should be used this way. Even though Greek scholars and Bible translators say, no, you're, avoiding the, you're missing the context. You're missing how the word was used in that first century time. And you're developing a whole doctrine around an improper interpretation of a word. But so often it will happen like that. As far as what comes from this morbid interest and propensity to dispute about words, well, it's not godliness. It's the opposite. Paul writes, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions. Now, as we see over and over again, false teaching does not produce godliness. False teaching can produce a lot of things. It can produce covetousness. It can produce discontentment. It can produce despair. It can produce inaccurate conceptions of God. It can produce inappropriate expectations of what God should do at any given moment because of what I do in any given moment. It can produce a whole lot of things, but it doesn't produce godliness. It produces things like this. First, Paul lists envy. Now, generally speaking, envy is a discontented displeasure at the real or perceived good of someone else. That's what envy is. I mean, envy is a serious thing. When you look at Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel, we find out that the religious leaders delivered up Jesus, we're told, because of envy. They didn't like that he was confronting them and he was getting limelight that they wanted. Maybe in this immediate context, it refers to the way in which a false teacher or a false teaching engager perceives someone to have had a better point than him or her or more knowledge than him or her, and they don't celebrate the perceived wisdom in others, rather they envy it. And love, we know, doesn't envy. But they do, because when you're swimming in the waters of false teaching, you will in some measure be deficient in divine love. All Christians are called to lay aside envy. 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Second, Paul lists strife. Right? Oftentimes, envy will manifest itself with contention. And that's what's being spoken about here. Strife is essentially contention. It's quarreling. And it could be just defined as it is in our English translation as strife. Third, he lists abusive language. And while the word that's used here could be rendered blaspheme, in this context, it means slander, essentially. The abusive language spoken of here is essentially slander. Fourth, Paul listed evil suspicions. Now this is speaking about the malicious suspicions as to the character and motive of those who, of those who differ from one another in these 
false teaching battles that were going on. Now, sometimes people will do things that will lead you to legitimately question their motivations. I mean, that just happens, and I get that. But that aside, these false teaching propagators will engender, in one way or another, <coughs> evil suspicions, which could be rendered here essentially as wicked opinions. I think that's important to remember. Quick pastoral note. All opinions are an innocent. Some opinions can be evil opinions, wicked opinions. You can't just say, oh, that's my opinion. If you want to be accurate sometimes, you're better off saying, that's my evil opinion. That's my wicked opinion. It's good for us to know because sometimes wickedness can hide out in plain sight, right? Dressed in the white garb of an opinion. But that evil suspicion, that wicked opinion might be called that, or should be called that when it is that. Well, it shouldn't be surprising that the previously listed effects of false teaching would lead to the net effect listed in the beginning of verse 5 where we read, end constant friction. Guess okay, essentially the fifth thing. Paul had listed four things. In verse 5, we see essentially the fifth thing, constant friction. So if you want a mathematical equation, envy plus strife plus abusive language plus evil suspicions does not equal harmonious living. It equals constant friction. Bill Mount suggests that the idea is constant irritation. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Doctrine doesn't divide. Doctrine unites. Sound doctrine unites an assembly around the inseparable truths of the gospel and God's word. But when you have false teaching going on or false teaching permeating and this person has this opinion and this person has that opinion and it's contrary to God's truth, it's going to lead to a lot of unhealthy things. And the net effect will be a lot of constant irritation. A lot of people rubbing up against one another in a way that's not healthy. A picture worth considering, by the way, is one suggested by the writer John Chrysostom, um, quoted in Bill Mounts' commentary. He said that Paul could mean, quote, that as infected sheep by contact communicate disease to the sound, so do these bad men. So that may be what's going on. This may be more language that is using kind of health slash medical imagery. Infected sheep coming in contact with the sound and causing their virus, as it were, their infection to spread and the irritation to spread as well. Now, from whence do all these problems come? Paul wrote, men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. Now, you've heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, Paul uses a word here that paints a picture that is worth many words. The word for depraved that he uses here, men of depraved mind, can be rendered in a bunch of ways. It could be rendered as destroy or decay or spoiled or corrupted. This word is used to speak of what moths can do. They can destroy and they could corrupt clothes like it's used in Luke chapter 12 verse 33. This word is used to speak of the outer man wasting away, 2 Corinthians 4.16. It's used to speak of how a third of the ships are destroyed as depicted in Revelation chapter 8, verse 9. So picture this. This is what it looks like. When a person is going down this road and they're involved with false teaching, it's as though their mind, the place from which thinking and sound thinking is supposed to emerge, has become decayed. It has become spoiled. It has become proverbially, as it were, destroyed. I mean, Paul is using language here. Remember that old commercial, like, this is your brain on drugs, right? It's as though Paul is saying, like, this is your mind on false teaching. It looks gross. You can't see it on an x-ray or something like that, but you can see it through the lens of Scripture. And say, so you might not see it, you may not even feel it, you may be walking throughout your day saying, I buy into some false teaching and I don't think it's that false at the end of the day. But really what it's doing at some level, it's affecting your thinking. It's causing decay, it's causing spoiling, it's destroying at least some things that would be there if that false teaching wasn't there. It's powerful language. Paul goes on and he says, such a one with such a mind is, again, interesting language, deprived of the truth. 
The word for deprived here can also be rendered as robbed. Robbed. Now that language does not negate the individual's culpability. Such an individual thought so little of the truth that they departed from it, to use language from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, and as a result were without it. But it does speak to a state of loss. It's reminiscent of the language that Jesus used in the parable of the sower when he spoke about men losing whatever they had or whatever they thought they had and having it taken away from them. Per George Knight, both of these clauses include the perfect tense which, quote, emphasizes the settled condition, close quote, of the corruption and deprivation spoken of. But he goes on and he notes this, that both of these clauses use the passive voice, which implies that this settled condition came about through another, which he suggests was the God of this world. Now again, to reference what I think is another commercial, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, right? Well, how do you not waste your mind? You renew your mind. <laughs> well, how do you renew your mind? You get into the Word of God and you get under sound teaching. If you don't want to waste your mind, if you don't want your mind to be decayed, if you don't want your mind to be infected, if you don't want to be walking around with a viral infection that you're just cohabitating with and living with in your thinking, you get into the Word of God and you get under sound teaching and you let the Word of God disinfect your thinking. So if you don't want to waste your mind, you've got to be under sound teaching and you've got to be in the Word of God. It has to be renewed by truth. The last thing that Paul writes in verse 5, saying about these false teachers, is, is that they are those who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Now, a quick couple of qualifiers. They don't mean this in a positive way. Like, oh, godliness is a means of gain in the sense of, like, godliness leads to greater joy. Godliness leads to a greater appreciation for what God has done for me in Christ. Godliness leads to more people seeing the image of God being renewed in my life. That's not what they're talking about here. He's talking about godliness as a means of financial gain, as a means of profit. And again, they don't mean this. They don't see this. And Paul doesn't mean this, I should say, in an appropriate way. As though, well, yeah, the scripture tells me to work hard and pursue skillfulness. And then I will, you know, profit as a result or to rightly steward my finances or something like that. They perceive godliness as a means of gain in an utterly wrong way. And this would have been abhorrent to, to the Apostle Paul as it should be abhorrent to us. Think about this. Individuals, and it's happening today, right? As it happened even in the first century. Individuals seeing Christ as a means to making money. That's abhorrent. False teachers love money. They love talking about money. They love getting money. They love trying to help other people get money by telling other people to give them money because then they'll get money. They have this pyramid scheme, you know, and they tap into the American dream so that others will help fund their American dream. And this is abhorrent. It was important to the Apostle Paul to think the crucified Son of God who procured forgiveness of sins for all who would believe in Him for the forgiveness of sins becoming nothing less than a commodity? Nothing less than a marketing tool? I mean, Paul wanted to make sure that nobody associated this with his preaching. When he was in Ephesus, he told them in Acts chapter 20, verse 33, I didn't covet anyone's silver and gold. I wasn't there to be about that. I was there to teach you and to preach the Word of God. When he was writing to the Thessalonians, he told them in 1 Thessalonians 2.5 that he didn't come to them with flattering speech nor with a pretext for greed. And he said, God is my witness. So he wasn't trying to like butter them up so that they would then finance him and help him become wealthy. And I want you to note this, right? These false teachers, these otherwise teachers, which could be found in pulpits and pews, right? They could be found anywhere. If anyone, going back to verse 3, Paul said, it wasn't that they were sincere, but sincerely wrong. That would still be problematic, right? 
You don't let somebody off the hook. You're like, oh, he's so sincere. He may be sincerely wrong, but at least he's sincere. That's still really problematic. The problem with these guys was that they were insincere and they were wrong. And they knew what they were about. And it wasn't about the gospel and the truth inseparable to it. They were about winning gold more than about winning souls instead of winning souls. They were about seeing their bank account grow instead of seeing people grow. They were about investing in temporal things for temporal rewards rather than investing in spiritual things for spiritual rewards. They wanted to be about their own business, seeing their own kingdom built, as opposed to being about God's business and seeing His kingdom built. To use language from Kent Hughes and Brian Chappelle, the fleece became more important than the flock. And here you see a description of what false teaching is and where it leads. And so what would be then an appropriate closing charge in light of our text today? Well, I think an appropriate one would be, here are things you have to be on the lookout for, whether they arise from without or they arise from within. So there's a defensive posture you are to take, but there's also a proactive one. You should treasure and see the necessity of the health-filled words of the Lord Jesus Christ and sound doctrine. It's as though hearing this truth about what false teachers teach should lead you to pursue more truth. Not just about false teachers, but anything that the Scripture has to say about anything. And let me encourage you with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The most healthful words you could hear will involve a call to the Gospel. Jesus said in John 6, 47, He who believes in Me has everlasting life. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. So let me just make a Christmas call, as it were. If there is anyone who has not received the free gift of salvation procured through the costly sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you to hear His health-filled words. The words that beget life. He who believes in Him has everlasting life. Jesus told His contemporaries, unless you believe I am, unless you believe I am He, essentially the Messiah, essentially Yahweh, unless you believe that's who I am, you will die in your sins. The ramifications of which is to forever pay for your sins, never paying off the debt that you owe. And it's as though God extends to you, as it were, the greatest gift imaginable in this moment. Forgiveness of sins, enjoyment with Him forever through receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, so you know what? I bow the knee. I am done trying to be the Lord of my own life. I'm done serving sin. I bow the knee and I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. I receive His health-filled words. I believe that He's truthful when He says He who believes in Him and believes that He is the Messiah has everlasting life. I believe He died on the cross, suffering on my behalf, and I believe that He rose again on the third day for my justification. And then I encourage you to receive His other health-filled words found throughout the Bible. But one that's important to remember is that one of the evidences that you truly believe the Gospel is found in what Jesus said, He who loves me keeps my commandments. It's just a reaction to seeing the great work of the Gospel. It's as though, it's as though the question should be asked, how could I not love you in light of what you have done for me? And how could I not serve you in light of the great love you demonstrated for me? So if you're going to believe sound doctrine, if you're going to receive wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine that accords with godliness, you'll see Him as the only way for forgiveness. you receive that gift of salvation and then you'll walk in accordance to the beat of His drum, as it were, and not to your own. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the prescription that is given to us throughout Your Word as to how we ought to be on guard against the lies that can so easily infect us.
I pray, Heavenly Father, that today's text might be used to help further protect Your dear ones, Lord. I know You love Your sheep. And I know You want Your sheep to be drawn near to You. You are jealous for their attention and their affection. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that seeing Your words as health-filled and soul-nourishing might provoke all of our hearts to treasure what You have given us in Your Word. Oh, may You lead us to treasure our Savior, the One through whom and for whom all things exist. May You help us to treasure the words of our Lord found in the text of Scripture. And may You help us, Heavenly Father, to be on guard against the lies that might arise from without or within, helping us to make the proper decisions of what we ingest and what we repudiate and stay away from. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for my brothers and sisters and all who are gathered in this building today. We love You. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.